This is Gareth Southgate, and this is the Three Lions Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Three Lions podcast. My name is Russell Osborne and this is an independent England football supporters podcast. I hope I find you well. Now, in the past, I've brought you various episodes, either previewing games, looking back at games, tournaments, or focusing on particular periods in England's vast history. And that is exactly what this episode is about. This is one of those ones that can be listened to at any time. You can come back to it. 2023 in England and across the United Kingdom has been a year of strikes by various organisations. In London, the underground has come to a standstill. Trains up and down the country have been disrupted. Airports up and down the country have had walkouts. Doctors and nurses have stayed away and schools have shut. This is just the tip of the iceberg. I've been affected by it and I'm sure you have too in some way, shape or form. But 20 years ago, a strike was a distinct possibility from quite an unusual group of people our very own England national football team. This is the story. It's the 23rd of September, 2003, a Tuesday. Just a regular day at Manchester United's training ground, Carrington. Rio Ferdinand has just finished training, showered and was on his way shopping for bed linen for his then fiance Rebecca Ellison. However, he had been selected to take part in an FA random drugs test as part of their new anti-doping campaign, along with Nicky Butt, Ryan Giggs and John O'Shea. He was to provide a urine sample after training. Now his account, according to his 2007 book entitled Rio, written with Sean Custis, was that he simply forgot about it, saying that he was in the process of moving house at the time, which was on his mind. Ferdinand was 24 years old at the time, and only the year before had transferred from Leeds United for around £30 million, a then world record to Manchester United. This a couple of years after he had transferred from West Ham to Leeds for 18 million. Again, a previous record at the time. A central defender who had made his debut for England back in 1997, coming on as a substitute against Cameroon. Soon after, an injury to Gareth Southgate forced his withdrawal allowing West Ham's Rio Ferdinand to become England's youngest international since the late Duncan Edwards in 1955. He'd had the opportunity to play for England earlier, but a drink-driving incident went against him, and he was chastised across the back pages of many of the English newspapers. He began to change his ways for the good, and was selected by Glenn Hoddle to go to France for the 98 World Cup, and he'd go on to win... 81 caps. Back to that missed test. Ferdinand claims that the test administrator had attempted to contact him, but he missed that initial call. Now, there are a couple of stories as to where he was when that call came through. There's one that says he was having his hair braided in a hair salon, whereas in his book, he claims he was having lunch with Isle Berkovich a former West Ham teammate of his. Either way, this was where he was to find himself in a lot of hot water. Obviously, he quickly knew the severity of this 
and tried to return to the training ground, but the testers had left. The following Thursday, he did take the drugs test, and the results that came back were negative. But the damage had already been done. He also undertook a hair follicle test that apparently can show traces of drugs in your system up to 18 months previous. Again, it came back negative. But the FA weren't happy with the incident, and all of a sudden, a lot of football bigwigs became involved. The FA's executive director, David Davis, Manchester United's chief exec, David Gill, and the club's solicitor, Morris Watkins too. In a meeting between them all, David Davis told Ferdinand that he wouldn't be able to play for England in the upcoming Euro qualifiers as he would be injured. At the time, the Premier League hadn't had a player convicted of performance-enhancing drugs, unlike the other major leagues around Europe. The FA had recently appointed a new chief executive, Mark Palios, and according to the independent newspaper, he was determined to make an example of Ferdinand for missing the appointment. He, according to Ferdinand, was the one who had instructed David Davis as a middleman to tell him he wouldn't be able to play for England. Palios wasn't at the initial meeting between all the bigwigs, and according to Rio's account, he himself, his agent, his manager, Alex Ferguson, all tried to contact Palios, but each time he was unavailable. Palios, incidentally, had been a former player at Tranmere Rovers during the 70s and 80s. By now, word was beginning to spread. Front page, back page, Sky Sports, News at 10. It was what all football fans were talking about at the time. Either at school, at work or in the pub. Remember, this was 2003. There was no WhatsApp group chats at the time to debate it. No social media either. So how big a deal was this? England. Well, England were in the process of qualifying for the European Championships of 2004 to be held in Portugal. They were in Group 7, along with Turkey, Slovakia, Macedonia and Liechtenstein. At the time, they were top with 19 points, with six wins and one draw. Turkey were in second place with 18 points. And the last game of the campaign was away to Turkey on the 11th of October. Winner of the group automatically qualifies. Second place goes into the playoffs. The date of the 11th of October is shortly after Rio had missed the drugs test. The FA were dragging their feet with how to deal with it. It's said that Sven Goran Eriksson was only made aware of the issue at the end of September when he spoke with United manager Alex Ferguson. Reading on England Football Online, it states that on the 5th of October, manager Sven Goran Eriksson delays announcing the squad to face Turkey for 24 hours. The following day, again, the announcement is delayed as they are awaiting the results of Michael Owen's injury. Then finally, on the 7th, his 24-man squad is announced. Ferdinand is missing from it. He'd been dropped. As manager, he'd only been able to select Ferdinand twice in the qualification games, away to Liechtenstein in March 2003, and home to Turkey at the beginning of April. Both, incidentally, England kept clean sheets. In fact, four of the games where Ferdinand was absent, they conceded. To Slovakia, home and away, and Macedonia, home and away. And he wasn't selected for the previous international window 
away to Macedonia and home to Liechtenstein because of a kidney complaint. I've come to Sopwell House in St Albans, Hertfordshire. It was here that the squad met up before leaving for Turkey. And it's here where Gary Neville gets involved. He is, of course, Ferdinand's teammate at Manchester United. Here's a chapter in his autobiography called Red, dedicated to the incident. He says this was the affair where he earned the nickname Red Nev. The Sun newspaper claimed he was the most hated man in football for what he was about to do. He was on his way to Sopwell House with his brother Phil when he got the call to say Rio had been left out of the squad without any conviction. He knew there and then this was wrong. So contacted Gordon Taylor, chief executive of the Players' Union, saying the FA should wait until hearing before punishing Ferdinand. United teammates Paul Scholes and Nicky Butt, also selected for the squad, felt the same. On arrival at Sopwell House, Neville had better luck in speaking with Mark Palios, but he wouldn't be swayed. Palios stood firm with the decision. Neville says Palios needed to look tough. From there, Neville went to talk with the rest of the squad. He wanted Rio reinstated. He spoke with captain and United teammate David Beckham, who called a team meeting to discuss how to go forward. Again, they went to Palios, who again wouldn't be budged. It was now talk of a strike came about and a secret ballot was called. So, this is the room. It's on the first floor. In we go. Mm. <laughs> um, Sopwell House uh, is a beautiful old Georgian country house built in the 18th century. Today... It's a hotel with 128 bedrooms. It's a country club and a spa. And to get to this room, I've come through a maze of corridors throughout the building. And this is the room that the hotel believe that this secret meeting took place in. I'm going to have a seat in one of these comfy chairs. Oh, it's a small room. Double bed, en suite, a couple of comfy chairs. It's probably been redecorated since 2003. Uh, it now has a flat screen TV on the wall. as a wardrobe to my right there. And a couple of large windows that look out over the lush green Hertfordshire countryside. There's a, uh, there's a building in the distance... A couple of cars just passing on the, uh, the country lane before it. <laughs> but it's, it's a small room. And I'm trying to imagine the England squad all squeezed in here. All about to vote on whether they should play in the forthcoming match away in Turkey. This is what Gary Neville writes in his autobiography. We gathered in a room and tore up a sheet of A4 paper into enough pieces for ballot papers. Yes to strike, no to go along with Rio's ban, with all the papers in a bucket so no one would know which way anyone had voted. There were 23 players in the squad and there wasn't a single no, it was unanimous. So Bex and I stood there in front and said right, so every single one of you has voted that we're not going to play this game unless Rio is reinstated. There was not a murmur. The story of the potential strike broke in the media. The players were branded as disgraceful. Millionaire players threatening to go on strike. It was getting out of hand and becoming too much for Neville to take. Thoughts of resigning for England were going through his mind. In the end, it was a call from Sir Alex Ferguson that persuaded him to change his mind. 
He said that there was a possibility that doing this, he could ruin his career. In the end, the statement was written. It is our opinion that the organisation we represent has not only let down one of our teammates, but the whole of the England squad and its manager. We feel that they have failed us very badly. One of our teammates was penalised without being given the rights he's entitled to and without any charges being brought against him by the governing body of the game. Rio Ferdinand was entitled to confidentiality and a fair hearing in front of an independent commission. We believe the people responsible for making the decision did not give Rio Ferdinand that due process and that has disrupted and made the team weaker against the wishes of the manager and the players. Sven Goran Eriksson tells it like this in his autobiography. The FA took all doping matters very seriously, and they showed no mercy to Ferdinand. A new chief executive, Mark Palios, had been installed, and he instructed me not to select Rio for the decisive Euro qualifier against Turkey on October 11th. I was facing a huge dilemma. I understood the FA's tough stance, but at the same time, Rio had not yet been found guilty of breaking the rules. Alex Ferguson, not surprisingly, did not appreciate the FA's actions against Ferdinand. One morning he called me at the crack of dawn. He was aggressive right off the bat. This time he wanted me to select Ferdinand in the squad, directly disobeying the order I had been given by my employer. I understand how you feel, I said, but I can't select Ferdinand. You have to call and yell at someone else. Many of the players were angry over what they saw as the unfair treatment of Rio, and they threatened to go on strike if Rio were not recalled to the team. I was put in a difficult position. It had not been my decision to drop Rio. It was the FA's. So I told Palios that it was his responsibility to confront the players and explain the decision directly to them. I am not sure things turned out that well. Palios was not an expert communicator. Finally, however, the players backed down and agreed to play the game. In a written statement to the press, they sternly criticised the FA's actions. In the stands, the FA turned down its ticket allocation and urged fans not to travel. The FA were fearful after the home match that England had won 2-0 in Sunderland, which had brought about 95 arrests, a pitch invasion and racist chanting for which the FA were fined £70,000. They were concerned if anything happened in the stands again, or within the vicinity, UEFA could impose sanctions, which could put their place at Euro 2004, should they get there, in jeopardy. A list of 1,000 known English hooligans was circulated to Turkish airports, where local officers were working with British intelligence. In the end, 45 individuals attempted to go, but got no further than Istanbul Airport. They weren't difficult to identify. Passport stamps marrying up with previous England destinations quickly gave them away. The team would board the plane bound for Istanbul. Martin Tyler was in Turkey for Sky, alongside Alan Shearer. Whatever the rights and wrongs of the Ferdinand case... The stance of the England players has made the stakes even higher for them. To the lack of reception, if you like, for the national up. Another real show of unity from the England players. Yeah, we've never seen that before with the arms around each other, Mark. Well, a quick resume on England for you. Having to manage without Michael Owen, of course, but Paul Scholes is back. So too Sol Campbell, Ashley Cole and Nicky Butt. It's Emil Heskey for Owen. And of course, John Terry stays in the side as a result of Rio Ferdinand's absence. Scholes, plenty of space on the left-hand side here for Steven Gerrard. England's lucky charm. Oh, penalty! Well, that lucky charm extends here to a run into the Turkish penalty area and... Referee Kalina pointing to the spot. Referee spot on. Well, David, that can be spot on. Oh, dear. He's lit, lit. And he's skied it. And Turkey have got plenty to say about it. He certainly lost his footing. It was an extraordinary miss. And England have done it. Plans can be made for Portugal next summer. England are the winners of the group. 
in which they have remained unbeaten and they've gained the draw tonight in a match that they did threaten to boycott. It keeps them just that one point ahead of Turkey. Unified in their approach in the team hotel back in England and a lot's been said about that. They promise unity on the pitch and Alan Shearer they've delivered it. You know we said stick together because we've stuck together all week through some of the tough times that we've had and uh, our rewards tonight. Tonight's performance shows as well there's definitely no split in the squad. Uh, well, I'd like to think so you know it, that didn't come from us you know the, the split in the squad it, the, the squad was just uh, was just rumours you know our players are all together every one of them is jumping in up and down out there and in there so um, there, there's no split in the squad we're as together as, as ever. Whilst England had qualified for the Euros, it wasn't over by a long stretch for Rio. On the 28th of October, the FA charged him. Their statement read, The FA has today charged Rio Ferdinand with misconduct for a breach of the FA Rule E26 with Regulation 1C of the FA Doping Control Regulations. Regulation 1C refers to the failure or refusal by a player to submit to drug testing as required by a competent official. The charge relates to the selection of Rio Ferdinand to submit out-of-competition testing on the 23rd of September 2003 as part of the FA's doping control programme. On the 19th of December 2003, at the hearing at Bolton Wanderers' then Reebok Stadium. He was banned for eight months, both domestically and internationally, and fined £50,000, starting as of January the 12th, 2004. This meant he couldn't play for Manchester United or England, and with Euro 2004 starting in June, this meant he would be unavailable for that too. The Disciplinary Commission unanimously found that the charge was proved against Rio Ferdinand. It was further decided he would be suspended for a period of eight months with effect from Monday 12th of January 2004 and be fined the sum of £50,000. Having requested a personal hearing, he was ordered to pay the full costs of the hearing. Such decisions are subject to the right of appeal. We're extremely disappointed by the result in this case, and in particular by the savage and unprecedented sentence which makes an appeal inevitable. I can confirm that Rio has the full support of Manchester United and the PFA, and there'll be no further comment at this stage. Ferdinand would return for Manchester United on Monday the 20th of September 2004 when he played in a match against Liverpool. Alex Ferguson praised his assuredness and composure as United won the match 2-1. As for Palios, he would resign from his position as FA's chief executive in 2004, following revelations around a relationship with an FA secretary, Faria Alam. He is now executive chairman of Tranmere Rovers. And Rio? Well, he received an OBE in 2022 for services to football and charity. And he can often be seen as a pundit on TNT Sports here in England. Many thanks for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. My name is Russell Osborne and this is the Three Lions podcast. You can follow the show on social media and get in touch too. Twitter, or X, at Facebook, Instagram, Threads, feel free to get in touch, or indeed by email, 3 Podcast at gmail.com. I'd just like to credit and acknowledge everyone for the information used and the help received for this episode. They include Gary Neville's 2011 autobiography, Red, by Corgi Books, Rio Ferdinand's 2007 autobiography, Rio, by Headline Books, Sven Goran Eriksson's 2013 autobiography, My Story, also by Headline Books, at the websites England Football Online, England Stats and the BBC. The Sky Sports match coverage was taken from YouTube 
Uh, I'd also like to thank Gary Trundle, Gary Lambert from Channel England on YouTube, Sebastian Sternsby from National Team Football on Twitter, John Costadine from Manchester Taxi Tours, and David Pettit from Sopwell House. You've all helped me very much. Thank you. I'll be back with you once again very soon with another episode looking at our England football team. I hope you can join me for it. So until then, take care of yourselves. Cheers. Cheers.